Thanks for the introduction, Berko. So, we're going to talk about PyPy, the JIT compiler, the faster version of Python. The talk is titled Understanding PyPy and Using It in Production. So, first, a bit of understanding into what makes it work, how it works, the internals, and how we have actually applied it and how you could do the same. Uh, slides are available online if you want to uh, follow on your own laptop, smartphone, something like that. First, something that is not actually related to PyPy, but I found this interesting to create. It's an overview of different uh, Python implementations. So at the top, there's C Python, the one we all know, I assume. But as I was building this overview, I started to realize that there's a whole lot of them. And I didn't even know all of them. For example, uh, so C Python is an interpreter. Um, and then there are several JIT compilers. So they start out as an interpreter, but they optimize certain bits of code. Uh, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> it looks... Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that thing about tablets and smartphones, please start using those. I'm not sure what to do here. Well, at least the skills are still doable. <laughs> Should have just used a picture. Sorry about that. Anyway, so there's a lot of them, um, both interpreters, JIT compilers, uh, but also ahead of time compilers. For example, uh, I just recently found out about uh, Nutka, uh, or Nuitka, I've never heard it pronounced before, uh, which compiles to C, similar to Shedskin. So if you're interested in this overview, uh, not like that, but the way it's supposed to look, feel free to look up the slides later or ask us. Uh, but the thing is also that uh, within this overview, there is PyPy, that's the purple line. As you can see, it's far from the first. On the other hand, it's also already quite mature to quite a few other options. Uh, like in the last three to four years, several additional JIT compilers are optimizing uh, Python uh, implementations have appeared. From those, PyPy is by far the most um, mature. So, uh, I want to give you a slight high-level overview of what PyPy actually is, uh, how it works and what it does. Uh, of course, as you know, it's a Python implementation, which is compliant, um, used to be compliant recent uh, 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 PyPy 2, uh, Python 2 version, but it's now lacking behind uh, slightly. And Python 3 is really much, uh, very much an ongoing thing, and um, it doesn't see much progress the last year. Uh, I, I suspect they will be doing more in the future. Uh, they must, actually, because they will get obsolete otherwise. And it's supposed to be fast, uh, which it didn't used to be, but since uh, about five years or so, it's actually faster than C Python. Um, so give you some advantages, um, which is the speed, which is the main purpose of the existence of PyPy. Um, it, pro it achieves it, this by uh, providing a tracing JIT compiler, and that allows to uh, allows inlining of functions and loop unrolling, etc. Uh, so basically, just the normal optimizations. Um, memory usage can actually be uh, better in PyPy. Uh, many people think that uh, PyPy actually gives more memory usage, but if you have a program that uses a lot of memory, um, the way PyPy works can actually allow you to uh, minimize, uh, get even less memory usage. Uh, and there are some features available that can uh, help you uh, do multi-core programming, um, so actually allowing you to, you to use multiple cores on one program. Um, there's a stackless feature, which is very similar to stackless uh, Python, providing micro-threads and greenlets, um, so you can uh, well, make concurrent code uh, that actually allows you to uh, use multiple cores. And there is the very, uh, still very uh, experimental uh, software transactional memory. It's currently mostly an academic thing still, although there is something that works, uh, but it has a lot of limitations still. Uh, but it may in the future actually uh, help us get rid of this global interpreter lock that's been the bane of Python's existence since its start. Uh, but as I said, it's very experimental still. Um, so what, what does it mean to have a tracing JIT compiler? Uh, it's just-in-time compilation. Uh, what that means is that it runs the code interpreted 
watches for the hot path. That's what the tracing does. So it traces the code and watches where it's actually useful to optimize. It does then that optimization and then just starts over again. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so then about the lower level. Um, so PyPy is a Python interpreter first, written in R Python. And uh, so then, well, what is R Python? Um, it's a subset of Python, like a strict subset. You can run it in any Python interpreter. Uh, and it's uh, statically typed in the sense that a variable can only hold a value of one type. You cannot switch one variable to a different type. And uh, there's a tool chain that translates R Python to C, primarily. And then that is compiled to produce the actual interpreter, the PyPy executable uh, that we use or we all use. Um, so this whole R Python tool chain, the whole uh, underlying foundation of PyPy, uh, it basically provides a framework for writing um, dynamic language interpreters with support for garbage collection and just-in-time uh, compilation. And this is not just an academic thing. Uh, multiple interpreters have actually been built, multiple language implementations have actually been built on this foundation. We'll come back to that later. And this also provides a nice bridge to explain the name, which sometimes has a tendency to confuse people. It's Python implemented in Python, hence PyPy. So how does our Python actually translate to C? Uh, this is a bit gory details, but we'll try to <laughs> summarize, <laughs> because there are a lot of gory details. So uh, first, our Python code is a strict subset of Python code, so it can just be imported with any Python interpreter. Then uh, there is an, a thing called the annotator, which um, performs a global analysis. Uh, like you give it one function, the entry point, and from that it basically performs symbolic evaluation uh, to follow all code paths, uh, to find all code that will be executed. And it builds up flow graphs as it does this. If you're interested in details, you well, feel free to look up what flow graphs actually are. Most of us, most of us will know graphs, though. Basically it. Um, then there is a second component called the R-typer. This takes the high-level output from the annotator and converts it into low-level types and operations, uh, which are um, just the level above an actual implementation language like C. So this can still be translated to C um, or, well, actually quite a few backends, but most of them are experimental. There's also a JavaScript backend, for example. Of course, there's a JavaScript backend. <laughs> yeah, but they, they kind of admitted that it's a mistake. It was an interesting exercise, but that's it. And then, after the R-typer, various optimizations are performed and function type identifiers are computed. Uh, so, in the backend uh, language, you won't see those as a user, of course. And then the C, the C backend, primarily, uh, colloquially called Gen C, uh, generates actual C source files and then compiles those. Uh, but as I said, gory details. So the previous slide was actually a huge simplification. I guess you can hardly read the text here. Sorry about that. Uh, I added the link at the bottom where you can find a huge page with lots of details about this whole translation, uh, well, workflow, so to speak. Um, th this diagram does at least show uh, how many steps there are and the fact that there are feedback loops where it takes a step back and reiterates of what it previously did to further optimize and further specialize on the code that it is translating, compiling. So then, running your code on PyPy, how to actually use it. It can start very simple. You just install PyPy. Uh, there's several options for that. Uh, for example, they provide a PPA for Debian and Ubuntu systems. Uh, you can compile it from source. You can download raw binaries if that's your thing. Uh, nowadays, uh, a lot of operating systems also provide uh, pre-built binary packages. Uh, so this is the simplest way to run your code on PyPy. However, it doesn't, it's not that easy when you use C modules. <laughs> uh, so CPython has a C API, uh, and a lot of extension modules are built using this C API. So they take an existing C-based library, and they, um, they make it available to Python using this C API. PyPy has a compatibility layer uh, for this C API, but it doesn't get you 
um, it gets you somewhere between, I don't know, 40 and 60%, but not far from all modules actually compile and work uh, successfully. So what would you do there? Um, the PyPy folks would have you use the CFFI module. Uh, CPython, the, the standard reference interpreter of Python, also has C types. Uh, which also provides like a dynamic bridge to C functions. CFFI does the same thing in a slightly different way. The major difference from an end user perspective or end programmer perspective is that CFFI uh, has a lot of special casing inside uh, PyPy so that it understands that it's dealing uh, with a foreign function interface and it optimizes those in the JIT compiler. And that does actually make a significant difference. And the original goal of the PyPy developers was to have this op these optimizations for C-types. But as they started to dive into that and develop uh, bridges and compatibility layers, they found out that it is far too inflexible uh, to actually optimize with the JIT compiler. Hence, this new project was born. And uh, you can see in the Python ecosystems that more and more packages are slowly uh, converting to CFFI because it's still also compatible with CPython but it's just much more compatible with PyPy. It can be heavily optimized to the point where basically you write 90% of your code in Python, and that last bit that you need, there you call C, and the resulting JIT compiled code is really, really efficient. So this is an example of how you use uh, CFFI. Uh, at the top, a module is defined uh, that uh, how do you say that? That uh, exposes some C functions. And then the bottom example shows how to use it. So really it's not that exciting, but you have to know some C of course, and specifically the data types in C. Uh, but once you know those, then this is not that hard at all. And really the differences between CFFI and C types on a high level are not that big. So moving on from CFFI, because we all like, like to write Python, right? Not C. And so a bit more about the software transactional memory that uh, I've mentioned before. Um, as I said, the ultimate goal is to have uh, Python without the global interpreter lock uh, and allow you to have multiple threads execute on the CPU concurrently. Uh, and uh, currently, it lives in a separate branch in the, uh, in the PyPy repository and you have to actually uh, use a, a patched uh, LLVM or GCC to, um, to compile it because it requires some, uh, some low-level operations uh, from, from the compiler. Uh, on a single thread, it actually brings you more uh, slowness, uh, but if you add a second core, uh, it already should bring you uh, performance uh, win. Um, what there are some gotchas there. Uh, the software transactional memory, what it does, it actually uh, runs your two threads of code concurrently, and if they happen to touch each other's, or at least the same memory region, then one of them gets rolled back and has to start again. Uh, so it's really an optimistic uh, concurrency. Um, but of course, if you have side effects, uh, you cannot undo those, uh, because if you already print something to the screen or send a packet on the network, it's gone. You cannot take it back. <laughs> so once that happens in a thread, it becomes inevitable. That means that it cannot be undone, and all other uh, threads that happen to touch the same memory, or at least interfere with it, uh, will have to be rolled back and uh, done again. Uh, so what it optimizes that and just stops everything at the point that it sees uh, uh, a side effect coming by, and just starts over from where it was. Um, so we have to really watch out with things like logging or file O network communication, because if you have uh, a loop running uh, and you think, oh, I can really have that all run concurrently, but if you have even one log line written to a file in there, every loop will just cut off all the other concurrently running loops because it had a side effect and all the others have to start again from the top. Um, so you have to, if you want to make good use of this, you still have to uh, be aware of it in your program, uh, but the logic of your program can be written as if it was just one thread of execution and you have no burdens of synchronizing everything because it will be done for you on the background, but not by a gill, but by something much more awesome. One moment, Bart. 
So one thing we haven't explained is why is software transactional memory so interesting if it's not even in like stock PyPy yet. It requires a separate branch. You have to separately compile it. Uh, there's lots of gotchas. Uh, still, programmers all over the world in lots of languages have found it really difficult to actually work with multi-threading and locks and synchronization and all of these things. And basically the grand scheme of things, the idea behind STM, that you could leave 90% of all of that burden behind. You write fairly obvious code, except for these gotchas that we mentioned, which may improve in the future. You write fairly obvious code, and still it can run on multiple CPUs. And basically the underlying framework takes care of the, the transactions, so either committing or rolling back. Uh, so this is why STM is so uh, interesting and why lots of people, lots of folks, uh, are following these developments uh, in PyPy. Okay? <laughs> So then uh, I want to show you this like, real-world use case of PyPy, because uh, Paylogic actually uses PyPy in production. Uh, not everywhere, but we have uh, at least one place. <laughs> um, and to give you a bit of history of why we came to be using PyPy, um, as you know, we sell tickets for big events, and especially events like Tomorrowland, uh, or today, well, today is not really a good example. <laughs> uh, but big events like Tomorrowland, Mysteryland, uh, there's a lot of people who want to go there, uh, but there's not enough tickets. So what ends up happening is that all the people uh, coming there at the time the sales start, and that basically means you get DDoSed by your own customers. Uh, this is actually what competitors call it. They say they have been DDoSed, and then the, they come to us, and then it works. Uh, <laughs> say half a million people trying to get your tickets. And it's not just a half a million people, actually, because they also start opening multiple browsers to enhance their chances. Um, so a solution is, of course, get a page where these people can wait for their turn. Uh, and we will tell them, OK, you, can, you are now eligible to get your tickets. Go ahead. Uh, but well, we serve that by a cluster of Amazon instances. Um, the way it's written, it requires some synchronization in state for some uh, uh, well, for some information for us, uh, some uh, statistics, and also to allow us to actually uh, tell the user an estimation of how much time he should be waiting. Uh, <coughs> but of course, there's still this problem of 500,000 page views, which is not easy to handle even for uh, several uh, uh, instances on Amazon, uh, because we, saw, we actually uh, delivered a whole HTML page to these people. Um, so we actually had to render the whole HTML page for every user, individual user, which would in effect actually refresh every minute. Uh, this is really heavy, and it was a really simplistic implementation. Uh, this didn't scale at all. Uh, so we ended up doing, uh, we added a CDN, a content delivery network, that just had a static HTML page with a templating, uh, uh, templating engine embedded. And the servers that actually did, some, did the queuing, uh, they just did a JSON uh, to, the, to the browser, and that could update the page with the information for the user. Uh, but they ended up still requiring quite a few uh, instances. And because the synchronization of the state uh, was not very optimized, uh, it ended up being still being a problem that the one instance that was responsible for synchronizing the state would get overloaded if we wanted to scale the, the thing up to be able to handle half a million people. It would just stop functioning, basically. Uh, and that's when we thought, OK, maybe you can just try PyPy. Uh, so I did a, a bit of research into what dependencies we had. We used uh, Tornado, which was perfectly fine on PyPy, I can assure you. Uh, well, we ended up not having any C, uh, C modules used, uh, so we just ended up adding PyPy in the command line, and it almost worked. <laughs> uh, so, give you a bit of a hint of what went wrong, uh, as you get the idea already. The first implementation of this whole queue thing was not very uh, optimized in any sense. And garbage collection works slightly different in PyPy. Uh, in CPython, you get reference counting, and uh, it stops execution to do a cycle detection since, I think, 2.3 or so. Uh, and it destroys the object as soon as it goes out of scope, because as soon as the reference count gets to zero, it just deletes it from memory, and it's gone. Same thing happens for file descriptors and, uh, and sockets, everything. In PyPy, 
because they want to optimize things, so they want to, don't want to have everything counting all the time because it's really a lot of overhead. So they do the same thing as, uh, uh, or at least a similar thing to what uh, Java VM, for instance, does. Uh, so they, they once in a while they stop the whole program, mark everything that's accessible from the start of the program, and everything that's left over they sweep it away. Um, but you don't want to do this every. Uh, well, every line of execution, basically, because you stop your whole program. Uh, so this means that objects can uh, still be alive, but not reachable by the program anymore, but they are still in memory and they still count towards limits from the operating system. So, so the infinite ones you got the collection of diamond, never stop the program, so in what sense is it incremental markers? This incremental part is fairly new. And uh, this increments during the uh, during the mark and sweep rounds. It still stops the program, but it just does it in uh, in a staggered, windowed uh, style. So the interruptions are really short. Uh, I think they say themselves it should be around maximum five milliseconds. Uh, but yeah, but originally uh, when we started using it, uh, this was not the case, uh, and it was still a full stop the world mark everything and go and sweep. And so in a big program, you would potentially have a really big stall. And this is also why the in incremental part came to be in, uh, I think, 2.2 or 2.1. Uh, so we had some issues. Uh, the, these machines, they would uh, recall their own information from the uh, AWS API. Uh, AWS provides an API for, uh, for an instance to collect data about itself. Uh, and this was actually not cached and used in a fairly small loop. Uh, so every call ended in, <laughs> in a network connection. And they stayed in scope, or stayed alive even while they went out of scope. So in CPython, this was not a problem because they get destroyed as soon as the loop ends and you and exit that function. Uh, but here, uh, they stayed alive, and we looped on and on and on, and you end up uh, at Linux saying, yeah, you can't have any more. Uh, but of course, a little caching and it was solved. Sorry. Uh, and that, of course, is obviously already a sort of a mistake. Uh, okay. Peter <coughs> found another issue later so on. More things did go wrong. Um, so one of the things that this uh, queue system uses is UUIDs. Yeah, Haro remembers that. <laughs> the, the completely <laughs> random kind, type 4. There's nothing specific in there. It's all random bytes. So it's supposed to be completely random. Uh, however, and these are actually, uh, basically every client of our queue system receives one of these. So yeah, they're supposed to be unique. Otherwise, uh, we get confused about which is which client. And then a while ago, we got these kinds of UUIDs. And at first, we were flabbergasted. We looked through half our source code, uh, looking to find the place where we were corrupting uh, the UUIDs that the standard library was generating. Couldn't find any single place. There was nothing wrong. We were not corrupting those uh, UUIDs anywhere. So we looked a bit further. And we ended up with just a PyPy interactive interpreter, and a loop that spit out UUIDs, and after about a thousand cycles, it degenerated into this bullshit. I mean, there were actually UUIDs with all bytes at zero. So of course, that's going to be a problem, because uh, you get confused about which client is which, uh, you give them duplicate places in the waiting line, so to speak. Very awkward, all in all. Um, and well, if you're interested in the details, the like these is a link to the actual bug tracker of PyPy where they identified this issue, and apparently, they copied the code uh, from the C Python reference implementation, which is fine there, but works a bit differently in PyPy regarding the interaction uh, between the, uh, the C boundary versus the Python side. Um, so it worked fine in C Python, PyPy not so much. So they end up, ended up switching the complete implementation of UUID type 4, and now it's fine. But for several months, we did have to patch that type of UUID generation to actually generate unique values, you know, like the one thing you expect the library to do. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> okay. So our results with PyPy, the interesting bit, or at least one of the most interesting bits. So at first, we could quadrupled our performance. That was back in 2013. Uh, now, nowadays, that's around eightfold due to uh, PyPy improvements. 
Uh, specifically, yesterday evening added the bit that we got for free by upgrading, because that's one of the nice things about uh, PyPy. Um, you make your Python software ecosystem compatible with PyPy. Admittedly, it's a bit of work. But after that, um, the PyPy interpreter and JIT compiler are still being optimized heavily. So with every new release, uh, you find speed improvements, generally. And there is still much more um, uh, potential there, and they have a lot of momentum. So uh, with every upgrade, we get a bit more performance. And we basically don't have to do anything unless you find new bugs. Um, and of course, this eightfold uh, performance improvement provided real savings for us in uh, hosting costs, because we needed less servers, obviously, to host this uh, queue system. Uh, but also, it just enabled it to simply work, because we need fewer instances, so there's fewer uh, lesser state to synchronize, so it actually worked out uh, fine. And with every upgrade, it gets faster, so all in all, we're quite happy with the upgrade at the switch to PyPy. And nowadays, the queue has been tested to work for at least two million visitors. So, um, so with no end still in sight, actually. Right. It was just stopped because it was way more than we would need currently. Yeah. So then, uh, I mentioned previously PyPy based on RPython. RPython, a tool chain to build interpreters. Uh, there have actually been several interpreters already built on top of it. Uh, for example, at the start, they built a JavaScript interpreter on top of uh, RPython or PyPy. And um, that was a bit of a mistake, but then other projects started to adapt or adopt uh, the PyPy toolchain, the RPython toolchain. So you get Hippie VM, which is now kind of defunct, the state is kind of unknown, but it's a PHP interpreter uh, built on top of this toolchain, also, of course, with a JIT compiler. And there's a Ruby interpreter slash JIT compiler, Topaz. And there's even a Lisp, Pixie. So all in all, a bigger, bigger, bigger ecosystem is building around uh, PyPy and RPython. And then one small fun note to end with, which we found uh, this week. Uh, the PyPy command line interface used to have an option called all opts for all enable all optimizations, uh, which was also called Fasen after Martijn Fasen, one of the speakers of today, because he used to frequently ask, how fast is PyPy? Like, is it fast enough for me to use already? And he kept pushing them. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Thanks for the so additional some, details. For some mysterious reason, when it got faster than Python, I never had to ask anymore. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh huh? Okay, that's the end. One small ending quote from uh, Guido, the original, uh, uh, the, the person who created Python uh, and the benevolent dictator for life. If you want your code to run faster, you should probably just use PyPy. Unless you use C modules, but we already explained that. <laughs> they should just start using CFFI and get done. <laughs>